There is strong demand for electric vehicles. The continued growth in electric vehicles. Being involved in electric cars right now is like being involved in computers in the 90s. EV sales have more than tripled over the past three years, with the largest market being China, followed by Europe and the US. And according to the International Energy Agency, one in five cars sold in 2023 will be electric. Lawmakers across the globe are driving EV production through incentives and regulation of the automotive industry. With China looking to phase out CO2 emitting cars by 2060, the EU by 2035, and the US announcing measures even sooner. I'm signing an executive order setting out a target of 50% of all passenger vehicles sold by 2030 will be electric. As demand for eco-friendly vehicles grow, a market that was once cornered by electric car makers is now seeing competition from more traditional brands. But it's not without its challenges, with buyers showing concerns over the sustainability, lifespan and range of batteries, as well as charging infrastructure. Raheem, where do you think the car manufacturing market is going? Do you think this transition to electric is really what we're going to see in the future? How long will it take? And do you think that electric will be the only way going forward? We are a very individual, very rare, if you want to call it last of the Mohicans in the car world. We're completely independently owned. We're not a large OEM. Um, in Germany, you've got Mercedes, BMW, VW, VW owns Audi and Porsche. We're the only other German mark. We're the last independent European sports car manufacturer. The last time I looked, I think most of the very cool sports cars come from Europe. So I'm very proud of that heritage. Uh, and I would like for us to continue making them the way we do. Um, I think that the future will be electric because the electric infrastructure is coming up now. And it's the only way to keep our cities at a very high level. And of course, the EU are saying there'll be zero emissions by 2035 in cars. But there's been a recent controversy because Germany has put forward to say, actually, we still want to use e-fuels in some of the engines. Where do you stand on that? I think that the, the, the world political dynamics have played a big role in that. I think most people will move to electric to be socially conscious, otherwise it will not be acceptable. I think Germany has left uh, the door open for some e-fuels and, and, and certain things to, to work simply because the world is not ready, not everybody is ready at the same time to put up such an expensive infrastructure. Were you surprised by the compromise? I kind of knew it would come, I felt like it would, simply because for a hundred years what we've been doing, it can't change in two years. It's going to take a little bit more time um, and up to 2035, I do believe that pretty much everything will have almost changed anyway. There'll be very few uh, combustion engines left on the road. And how long do you think that transition's gonna take, in your opinion, Raheem, from what you've seen and the cost of it? Well, for example, Germany has already put down uh, a very, very large uh, e-infrastructure. Here in this factory alone, we're about to put up 20 fast charges. Um, so I think slowly the rest of the world will follow. Uh, most of the big OEMs are going electric and the electric car technology, once you get into it, uh, is actually better. Once you get used to driving an electric car, it becomes very difficult to go back to a combustion engine. How quickly is technology changing the landscape? It's changing as we speak uh, and it is completely changing the landscape. I also think that the next generation will play a very big role because they will want to get into uh, electric cars. If you look at the London taxi, a year ago, a year and a half ago, they were all combustion engines. Today, I would say 75% of them in London are all electric. The speed of change has been incredible. Is it expensive for the transition for a lot of car manufacturers? And do you think they're willing to take that on? Most car manufacturers are very large OEMs and they have already decided to go down this path. I do not see it coming back. There are very few companies like ourselves that have been able to switch and so successfully into the technology that we've now demonstrated. Do you feel it's a risk though? It is a massive risk. It is a ma everything is a risk, uh, but we have to do what's right. And this is definitely the right way forward. Of course, there's a little bit of debate about how sustainable 
and environmentally friendly batteries will be going forward. How do you feel? I think growing up a bit in Africa as well, uh, in an oil-rich country, I see the damage that oil does do uh, to the environment, to the sea, to the communities, and then of course to the air. I think batteries are cleaner, and as we get a little bit, as I can see the technology moving, we're not going to require the kind of um, minerals and things that we think. Also, the way we've designed the car, we can continuously upgrade our batteries. We may be able to add to them and use what we have there for other things. For the electrification of Project Thunderbore, Wiesmann partnered with German company Roding Mobility, who creates state-of-the-art battery systems for automotive and aerospace industries, as well as the maritime sector. We call ourselves as one of the worldwide fastest one-stop shops for electrification and uh, specialists for mobility prototypes. Gunter Riedel is co-founder and CEO at Roding and worked closely on Project Thunderball to create the two electric motors and battery for the car. So the task was quite difficult how we spec the car in terms of range, in terms of power and how we can transport the emotions which the heritage cars had initially to a new age, into the electrification age. To make the prototype they created the battery design from scratch. So you had to reinvent things, you had to re-engineer things and um, for us of course one of the major tasks was to set up a proper supply chain for all the products we have into the car. Lisa Kumshia oversees the engineering process at Roding. Here we do all the electrical stuff, we crimp all connectors and things like that and put all the models together and in the end do some end-of-line testing to see if everything works fine. Roding also builds the carbon fibre parts of Project Thunderball, which Lisa says offers an advantage. We have the approach for, for the vehicle to um, build as much carbon fibre parts as possible to chain um, more lightweight uh, advantages and therefore it's also good for the electrification of the uh, vehicle because lightweight you get a better range with the car and this always helps an electric vehicle. Wohin, why did Wiesmann choose Roding as the electrification partner? Since I'd started this, I've only been looking for the best, whether it's paint, whether it's leather, and Roding really appealed to me. They have been doing incredible projects. I'm not allowed to mention most of them, but when, if you ever get to find out, you'll be extremely impressed. What kind of technology and what kind of impact does technology have on what you're doing? It's just huge. Technology is moving at, at light speed. At the same time, I truly believe that you have to you know, use a little bit of your own common sense when you're building things like this. For example, you know, we've put in, I think we're one of the first companies, if not the first, to put in a, a gear system or a level system in our regenerative braking. Um, and we've done many things with technology that are slightly different. We do not have the batteries uh, in, in the base or the skateboard. We have the batteries in the front. It allows us to change it. We haven't changed the dials or the inside of the car too much, so it's always timeless. So these are things that you have to think about uh, going forward. Brought to you by Patronus.